Today we will be talking about cells. Uh, we're going to learn about different types of cells, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, um, animal versus plant cells. But first we need to outline some main features of the cells. Cells are highly organized structures that are not static. They change, they're dynamic, they can grow, they can divide, they can move. Cells can be very small, um, like these cells shown here. Uh, cells can be significantly larger, like these large bacterial cells shown here. Um, human body counts uh, about 100 trillion cells. And actually, by definition, all living organisms are composed of cells. Anything that is not composed of cells is not living. The fundamental postulate of a cell theory is that all cells arise from other cells via cell division. And during the cell division, parental cells pass the hereditary material DNA to the daughter cells in order to um, vertically transfer the genetic features from the parent to a offspring. Generally speaking, cells have similar chemical composition, but of course, structurally, they can be quite different. The science that studies cells is called cytology, and the main tool of people who study cells, of course, are microscopes which is this dissecting microscope with a little bit less magnification, but specifically this compound light microscope, which can allow scientists to magnify cells one or two thousand times compared to the regular size. Now, first, we're going to talk about eukaryotic cells, and all eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, and the membrane-bound organelles. Most likely, eukaryotic cells originated from prokaryotes, cells without nucleus, so it was a separation. Prokaryotes remained and eukaryotes branched away. <clears throat> the general function of the nucleus is to store genetic information, copy it, replicate before the cell division, and to express it for the purpose of protein synthesis. The genetic information is um, stored in the DNA, and DNA in the nucleus exists in the form of a chromatin. Chromatin um, consists of multiple linear chromosomes. You can see a um, schematic depiction of chromatin here. That will be kind of chromatin 2. Um, Nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. It's not just a membrane. It is two membranes that enclose the nucleus. You can see one membrane layer purple and another membrane layer being beige. Uh, in that nuclear envelope are nuclear pores that allow the transport in and out of nucleus. Specifically, um, RNA has to be able to get out of nucleus and proteins have to be able to get in and out of nucleus. And the size of nuclear pores um, just small enough so that RNA and proteins can leave the nucleus and DNA cannot. Deep in the nucleus you can find a structure, separate structure, it is not membrane bound, called nucleolus or the small nucleus. And the function of the nucleolus is the formation of the ribosomes. Adjacent to the nucleus is an endomembrane system of the cell, which basically a series of intracellular structures made of membranes. And the main function of that system is to move materials through the cell, uh, from one part of the cell to another, and to the cell membrane. Endomembrane system consists of 
four organelles. As you can see, rough endoplasmic and smooth endoplasmic reticulum here, Golgi apparatus and various vesicles. Um, so let's start with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You can see it here. Rough endoplasmic reticulum is the place where the ribosomes are housed. Ribosomes are small particles, not membrane-bound particles that are responsible for the protein synthesis. Endoplasmic reticulum that does not have ribosomes is called smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And its main functions are synthesis of lipids and carbohydrates, and also neutralization of toxins, detoxification. Adjacent to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but farther from the nucleus, it's the Golgi apparatus shown here. Golgi apparatus receives proteins from rough endoplasmic reticulum. They are transported, you can see the transport vesicle here. They are transported to Golgi complex, um, where proteins undergo uh, various modifications, not only proteins, but lipids as well. So lipids and proteins synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum end up in the Golgi, and Golgi is responsible for the modification of those two molecules. And vesicles like this one exemplified, vesicles are responsible for transport functions. They move proteins and lipids from endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi or from Golgi to the cell membrane. Um, last part of endomembrane system, so the lysosome, it's still a part of the endomembrane system. Lysosome breaks down things, breaks down food, damaged organelles, um, various cellular debris. It's basically kind of a, um, a sanitation crew in the cell. Um, peroxisome, on the other end, peroxisome is not a part of the endo endomembrane system. Its function is the control of levels of hydrogen peroxide in the cell. It also participates in the biosynthesis of lipids and carbohydrates. Now, uh, lysosome participates in the process known as phagocytosis, which can be translated into cellular eating, phago eating, cytosis cells. Uh, phagocytosis is characteristic for the cells of immune systems such as macrophages and dendritic cells. These cells um, engulf a pathogen or a food particle in the vesicle. Then vesicle here fuses with the lysosome and components of the lysosome destroy the acquired food or pathogen, the release undigested material well and whatever is digested is digested. Okay. Every cell is surrounded by the cell membrane. Cell membrane is the phospholipid bilayer. You can clearly see phospholipid bilayer on this image. Inside of the membrane, along with the phospholipid bilayer, you can find other biological molecules, such as proteins. Um, for instance, transmembrane proteins or peripheral proteins, lipids, cholesterol, and carbohydrates that can be modifications to the lipids in the membrane or can serve as the modifications of the proteins in the membrane. Of course, the main role of the membrane is to separate <coughs> the intracellular space from the environment and if you look at the structure of the cell membrane the hydrophilic hands here and here they are facing either outward or inward watery environment outside or inside of the cell the hydrophobic portions hydrophobic tails of phospholipids they are like um, lunch meat in the sandwich, 
are in the center of the bilayer between the hydrophilic heads. The cell membrane is not a solid structure, okay? It is fluid. It's called a fluid mosaic model. The components of the cell membrane, including phospholipids, transmembrane, and peripheral proteins, they move around, they change position, but the basic structure of the membrane still maintained. One of the key regulators of the membrane fluidity, as we mentioned before, are the molecules of cholesterol right here. Now you may ask, why do we need proteins in the cell membrane? Well, if you think about it, um, in order for a signal to get across the membrane, you need some kind of a signaling protein. In order for hydrophilic substances to get across the membrane, you need a transport protein. And this is what we're going to be talking about next transport across the membrane. Transport across the membrane can be passive and active. In passive transport, there's no energy required for the chemicals to cross the membrane, which means that chemicals move from the high concentration to their low concentration. It is also called that chemical move along the concentration gradient. Now there are two types of passive transport, simple diffusion, shown here, and facilitated diffusion, shown here and here. So what is the difference? In simple diffusion, hydrophobic molecules diffuse directly across the membrane. You can see it on this image. They can do it because the this inner part of the membrane is hydrophobic as well and it allows for the easy passage of hydrophobic molecules directly across the membrane. Hydrophilic molecules cannot pass that hydrophobic barrier and in order to cross the membrane they have to use transmembrane proteins such as channels or carriers. Unlike passive transport, active transport does require energy in a form of ATP or another form. However, this energy allows special proteins, transmembrane proteins called pumps, to move to pump chemicals from their low concentration to their high concentration. If you look at this illustration, you may notice that the concentration of sodium on this side of the membrane is lower than the concentration of sodium on that side of the membrane. But nevertheless, the sodium-potassium pump moves sodium ions to the area with a higher concentration. And conversely, potassium is pumped against its concentration gradient from the area with its low concentration the area that's high concentration. Now movement of water across the membrane carries its own specific name. It is called osmosis. In essence, osmosis is a passive transport. It does not require energy. It's a movement of water from the lower concentration of solutes, not water, solutes, to high concentration of solutes. Essentially, you can think of it this way, that water moves towards higher concentration of solutes in order to dilute them. Based on the relative concentrations of the solutions outside and inside of the cell, the solution which concentration equals to the concentrations of solutes inside the cell is called isotonic. Here you can see isotonic solution with a 20% solid concentration inside and outside of the cell. In this case, net movement of water is zero, and the cell doesn't change its volume. Hypotonic solution shown here on the right is the solution in which concentration of solutes is lower than the concentration of solutes inside the cell. 
So since intracellular concentration of solutes is higher, water will be moving into the cell. Cell will swell. And if it doesn't have any barrier that prevents it, prevents it from lysing, it will essentially swell and eventually break down. Now, hypertonic solution is the one in which concentration of solutes is higher than the concentration of solutes inside the cell. When cell is placed into the hypertonic solution, water starts to move out of the cell, which leads to the cell shrinking and shriveling. So here you can see an illustration with human red blood cells. In isotonic solution, human red blood cells maintain the proper concentration, uh, proper shape. If you put human red blood cells in a hypertonic solution, they will start to look shriveled. And if you put them in a hypotonic solution, they will swell and eventually burst like this cell in the right hand corner. What if you need to move really big molecules in and out of the cell? So in the process called endocytosis, you can move large fragments, large particles into the cell. There are three main types of endocytosis. First one being phagocytosis. We already mentioned that. The membrane of the cell forms so-called pseudopodia, which engulf a particle and take it into the cell in the vacuole that is sometimes called a phagosome. Um, phagocytosis may take cells, cellular fragments or debris into the phagocytic cells. In pinocytosis, formation of this invagination, scavioli, brings the extracellular solution into the cell. Some people refer to it as a cellular drinking. And in receptor-mediated endocytosis, molecules, large molecules, such as lipoproteins or viruses, can bind to the receptor on the cell surface. That very specific binding will trigger the formation of clathrin-coated vesicle that takes in whatever is bound to the receptor. So receptor-mediated endocytosis, it's a pretty specific process that depends on the binding of these molecules or viruses to the receptors on the cell surface. Now, exocytosis, as you can tell from the name, is responsible for the transport out of the cell. Exocytosis is responsible for secretion of proteins, uh, neurotransmitters, for instance, um, getting rid of cellular waste and cellular debris to get it out of the cell. So again, endocytosis is in and exocytosis is out. Cell shaped is maintained by cytoskeleton. Cytos cytosol by itself looks like a pretty dense goo and it cannot properly support by itself the shape of the cell. But with the cytoskeleton, cell can maintain its original shape, it can grow, it can divide, uh, it is even responsible for transport in the cell. Certain elements of cytoskeleton can change, can be destroyed, it can be reformed back. So three types of filaments that comprise cytoskeleton are microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. Microtubules consist of a protein tubulin shown here, the green beads. And these structures of cytoskeleton are dynamic, meaning that they can break down and they can be formed back. The main function of microtubules are the process of cell division. They participate in the movement of the cell, the locomotion, and they're responsible for intracellular transport. They are like little railroads on this picture. Microtubules are labeled green. They're like little railroads that allow vesicles to move inside the cell. Microtubules also form flagella. Microfilaments in the center on this micrograph, they are red, are formed by the protein actin, 
and they are also dynamic structures. Just as microtubules, microfilaments can break down and reform. They actively participate in the cellular movement, cellular locomotion. Actin is indispensable for a process of muscle contraction, which is, in essence, also a locomotion. Unlike microtubules and microfilaments, intermediate filaments, shown on this micrograph, are static. They break down when cell dies. They like beams and studs of a house. If these are gone, the house is gone. They're responsible for maintaining the structure of the cell and protect the cell from any kind of mechanical stress. And intermediate filaments are usually made of the protein called keratin. The external appendages of eukaryotic cell are flagella and cilia. So cell may have one or a few flagella. Eukaryotic, you can see the cross section of a eukaryotic flagellum. You see multiple microtubules arranged together. Flagellum, uh, when it is propelling eukaryotic cell, it moves like an oar, not like a propeller, like an oar on the boat. And another structure that also assists in locomotion of the cell is cilia. You can see a layer of cilia right about here. So that's cilia. That is cilia here. Okay. Uh, or cilia on that uh, microorganism. Cilia may either uh, work like a bunch of pores. There are many of them always. A uh, bunch of pores in this microorganism propelling it forward. Or on human cells and human tissues, they may help to propel mucus, in the bronchi or trachea or fallopian tubes. Um, two very interesting structures that can be found in um, eukaryotic cells are mitochondria and chloroplast. So here you can see mitochondria, a double membrane organelle that's red is an outer membrane and that um, inner is the inner membrane i'm going to switch the color so that's inner membrane right here um, the function of mitochondria also shown on this electron micrograph the function of mitochondria is to take nutrients and convert their chemical energy into chemical energy of atp ATP that then can be used in various cellular processes. That process in the mitochondria, when chemical energy of nutrients is converted into chemical energy of ATP, called a cellular respiration. Now, chloroplast, just like mitochondria, has two membranes, outer and inner. But um, unlike mitochondria, the function of a chloroplast is to convert a solar energy into the chemical energy of carbohydrates during photosynthesis. So essentially, chloroplast converts solar energy into the chemical energy of carbohydrates, and then mitochondria can take chemical energy of carbo carbohydrates and convert it into a chemical energy of ATP. The unique structure of both mitochondria and chloroplasts at least the fact that they have two membranes, unlike all other organelles that are surrounded by one, led American scientist Lynn Margulis to suggest so-called endosymbiotic theory, which described the generation of mitochondria and chloroplasts from the bacterial cells. So the idea was as follows. There was some proto-eukaryotic cell that eventually acquired an aerobic bacterium, a proto-mitochondria that was capable of cellular respiration. Some cells that would later become plant cells, in addition to mitochondria, also acquired photosynthetic bacteria that upon acquisition became chloroplasts. So here you can see proto, well, proto-mitochondria is here, 
protochloroplastis here, and on this image, you see a mitochondria and a chloroplast after the acquisition. So mitochondria only, cells that acquired only mitochondria became animal cells, fungal cells, and some protozoan cells. Um, but cells that acquired both mitochondria and chloroplasts became photosynthetic eukaryotes, such as algae and plants. So what is other evidence that could support endosymbiotic the theory? Well, first of all, unlike other organelles, you know that DNA is present in the nucleus. Turns out DNA is present in both mitochondria and chloroplasts, and it's similar to bacterial DNA. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have ribosomes, which are similar to bacterial and carry out protein synthesis. Both mitochondria and chloroplast have two membranes, as we mentioned, and it looks like they were acquired in the mem membrane of the vacuole where these microorganisms were initially, you know, it remained. And both mitochondria and chloroplasts, they have some degree of independence. If you isolate them, and you can do that, you can isolate pure mitochondria, pure chloroplast, and you put them in the egg, they will be dividing without the cell. So since we were talking about mitochondria and chloroplast, it's a good time to talk about cellular respiration, the process in which cell generates energy, generates ATP. So four steps of cellular respiration are glycolysis, transition step, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, well, it counts five, but usually transformation, transition step and Krebs cycle, they are merged. Then we have electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So during glycolysis, a molecule of glucose is converted into two molecules of pyruvate. There's not much ATP produced, but this process yields some high energy electrons. During the transition step and the Krebs cycle, pyruvate is oxidized, carbon dioxide, and a lot of high energy electrons are produced. Not much ATP though. Then in the processes of electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, high energy electrons are used to create the gradient of hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial mem membrane. And that gradient of hydrogen ions leads to diffusion of hydrogen ions across the membrane, and that diffusion provides energy for the ATP synthesis. Along with ATP synthesis, there's also some water produced. So cellular respiration, cellular aerobic respiration, probably the, the most it's most efficient way to generate ATP um, in cellular respiration we can use carbohydrates we can use fats we can use proteins as the primary source so instead of glucose with some modifications cellular respiration may oxidize um, fats and may oxidize proteins and some metabolites you can see here can merge into different steps of oxidative respira uh, cellular respiration. Carbohydrates, glycerol, and some amino acids can enter the process of glycolysis. Other amino acids can enter Krebs cycle, and some fatty acids and other amino acids can also enter the Krebs cycle. Now, so far we were talking mostly about the animal cell, we're going to briefly highlight the main features that distinguish um, plant cells from animal cells. They have practically all the same organelles, but there are some that are not found in the animal cell, for instance, cell wall. Cell wall, shown here, it maintains the shape of the cell, and the central vacuole it maintains the pressure against the cell wall, essentially also allowing plant cell to maintain its shape.
Central vacuole can also be used by plant to store nutrients in the form of sap. And finally, chloroplast. We discussed it before. Chloroplasts are not found in animal cell. They are carrying out photosynthesis. Along with two types of eukaryotic cells that we talked about, animal and plant, uh, a vast majority of cells on Earth, overwhelming majority, are prokaryotic cells that do not have a nucleus. They do not have a nucleus or any membrane-bound organelles. So there are four structures that can be found in any prokaryotic cell. It's a nucleoid, cytoplasm, cell membrane, and ribosome. Nucleoid, shown on this picture, stores genetic information in the form of DNA. Usually it's a single circular chromosome. Cytoplasm essentially feels the cell from the it feels the interior of the cell and cell membrane uh, pretty much just like an animal cell separates the cell from the environment just like in the animals or plants membrane is semi fluid membrane fluid mosaic model remember that ribosomes just like in plant or animal cells synthesize proteins. Some bacterial cells, some prokaryotic cells have cell wall. Here, cell wall um, uh, allows cells to pr be protected from lysis, uh, especially if they are in the hypotonic environment. Unfortunately, many bacterial cells have capsules. You can see a capsule um, capsule increases generally pathogenicity of bacteria, allows them to stick to the surfaces better, and it protects them from predation, so they become more resistant to our immune system. Many bacterial cells have flagella, okay, and basically just like in eukaryotic cells, flagellum is necessary for movement. Now, to summarize the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we can compare them first of all in size. Prokaryotes, here on the left, are smaller than eukaryotic cells on the right. Of course, eukaryotic cells have much more complex organization. Okay. Um, prokaryotes do not have nucleus, while eukaryotes do. Prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles, while eukaryotes do. Many prokaryotes have cell wall. Among eukaryotes, that is reserved for plants, including algae and fungi. In prokaryotes, genetic material is stored in a nucleoid that is not surrounded by membrane, while in eukaryotes it is stored in double-membraned nucleus. And, but there are common structures between pro and eukaryotes. All cells, all cells contain DNA. Well, okay, some few exceptions of human cells, but DNA, plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and ribosomes. So fundamentally, those four structures are common for pro and eukaryotes. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about um, main types of signaling between the cells and the first step will be autocrine signaling so here you can see a chemical that is produced by this cell here it is produced by the cell it acts on the same cell by interacting with the surface receptor right here this is called autocrine self paracrine signaling is when one cell produces a signaling chemical and the signaling chemical binds to the receptor on the adjacent cell and acts on it. Okay. And then there's endocrine signaling when um, a chemical, also called hormone, produced by a cell, it enters the blood and blood delivers it to some distant cell. And there, the signaling chemical or hormone binds to the receptor on the surface or it can bind to the receptor inside the cell. 
Now, a fairly unique way of signaling between the adjacent cells is a gap junction. Unique, I mean, not that it's like in only one cell, but it mostly is uh, limited to cardiomyocytes, uh, the muscle cells of the heart, and smooth muscle cells in the walls of the hollow organs. So, gap junction is essentially a set of ion channels that provide the communication between these adjacent cells. These ion channels allow cells to exchange chemical messages directly rather than releasing them, like in the case of autocrine, paracrine, or endocrine signaling.